Praise God. Good evening, Sister Ruth. We're waiting on everybody to get on here. You're the first one on, I believe. Sometimes people may get on and not let you know that they're on. But <laughs> Anyway, uh, sorry to hear about your grandfather. Uh, he's not doing good at all. We're praying for him, praying for your mom and your dad. So, hi, Sister Layton. We're waiting on different ones to get on. And um, before we get started here tonight, all right, I may, uh, I might uh, give a little report on Brother John Budd. Of course, most people know that he is in the hospital on life support with coronavirus. And uh, he's been going on a month, I guess, almost in the hospital, three weeks and a bit. But next, uh, well, yesterday was three weeks, I think. I'm, I know it's at least that long. He went in on a Wednesday, so that that should be pretty close. You have to forgive me for my drainage of just this time of year. It's just that way. I have sinus and allergy problems and pollen's high, and so I always have a little bit of trouble with drainage. I, 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 uh, I'm sorry for that interruption, but I just can't seem to do anything about it. Um, um, so keep praying for Brother Bud because they definitely need a miracle. And, uh, you know, he's a dear friend of mine and I, I love him very much. And I'm, I'm praying God spare his life, give him a few more years. And then Brother Dial in Jacksonville, Florida is in the hospital. And he needs our prayers. And, and his son, Darren, and his wife, they, they're in need of prayer today. So keep them in your prayers. Brother, um, uh, Brother Dwayne Jolly had, had a heart attack, but he just really needed his fibrillator adjusted and his medication adjusted, and he's okay. Yeah, he's doing okay now. Uh, Brother Jose Luis in Monterey, Mexico, he works very close with Brother Bud and Brother Memo Cano, and um, and he's, a, I don't know if he's in the hospital yet, but he is, I think he is, he, he does have coronavirus and he is, he's having trouble with oxygen in his lungs, so we certainly need to keep him in our prayers. I love that brother, he's a really faithful, good, good man of God. <laughs> Uh, so remember him. Um, this Corona deal is, you know, it's a, it's a sad situation we're going through, but I know the Lord knows what he's doing and I know God is uh, in charge of everything that's going on and I know this is a time of change in God's timetables to change for the world, it's a change for the body of Christ. And so we'll have to see. Amos uh, said that the Lord doeth nothing, but first he shows it to his prophets. So I know the people of God won't be left in the dark. God is, is dealing with his ministry and God will help us to understand uh, as time goes on. We'll see a little bit more, but I feel confident that the Lord is um, uh, definitely in charge and he's not caught unawares he definitely knows what's going on and so you know it's a time of it's a time of prophecy where we're fixing to enter into more uh, fulfillment of prophecy I feel certain of that because I know we're getting close to the end of the world and I know you've been, you know, those of you that's been on have been listening to my messages. You know, I've been dealing with that now for uh, some time since we've started these uh, live broadcasts and since coronavirus. 
And so, uh, I, um, I'm, I feel, I just feel to continue dealing with it a little bit. Um, one of the things that I'm not, I, I, I think I'll deal a little bit with the 17th chapter of the book of Revelations tonight, but before I do, I'm going to make a statement uh, about the seven churches of Asia. Um, the, uh, the book of Revelation, it's important to understand how it's written and, um, you know, how it's put together. Uh, you'll never understand the book if you don't. And so <clears throat> I want to go back first in the very beginning and just explain. Uh, the reason I want to make this, this statement and explanation is because um, there are several that believe and have taught that the seven churches of Asia are uh, dispensations of the Gentile church ages seven different dispensations of church ages. I can't, I cannot agree with that. And I'm going to tell you why. Um, so, um, the first thing I want you to know is, is that, well, let me just go into explaining it and I'll explain why that I can't concur with that teaching. I feel I feel confident that this, these seven letters were written to the seven churches, physical churches that were in Asia. Paul's works, of course, he was already dead, and uh, the apostle John was the one that was the only living apostle that was overseeing those churches at that time. In fact, he was the main, you know, he was the only apostle of chief apostles over the churches at that time. Of course, you know, the, the church was waning. We were right, they were right down in the end of the Jewish world and, and the churches were waning. So let's go to the first chapter in the first verse and I'll explain why I can't condone, condone church ages. Um, he starts off in the first verse. It says, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him, unto him, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. It, it, it looks like in reading that, that Jesus didn't even really have this full revelation, uh, at least not in the same magnitude, until he got back to heaven after his resurrection from the dead. And then God, the Father, uh, gave it to him to show to his servants. And so Jesus sent an angel to show it to his servant, John. Now let's read verse two, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. That's talking about John, John who bear record of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus and all the things that he saw with with the other 12 while he was with Christ. Then verse three said, blessed is he that readeth and they that heareth the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand. Now he certainly couldn't have been talking about that the 2000 year world or what we're going through right now, 2000 years later was the time that was at hand when he spoke this. And he, he clarifies it a little bit. Next verse says, John, to the seven churches, which are in Asia, grace be unto you. Uh, hold on just a minute. Let me see here. No, I want to go back to the first verse. I'm sorry. I, I, did, I should have mentioned this first. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. They were shortly to come to pass and they were, the time was at hand. Well, that shows that it's, uh, something was 
very urgent right now at that time, not, not where we're living, but right then, I should have said, for to be uh, the seven churches of Asia to be notified. And so he then he has John to write these seven churches, to the uh, seven letters to the seven churches. And in each one of those seven churches, he ends his letter with a promise to overcomers. You know, uh, it's his letters start in chapter two with with uh, the church at Ephesus, and um, he ends that letter stating, um, "To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God." That's in the seventh verse. Chapter 2, 7. He's, he's telling that to the church at Ephesus. So he's telling them that they could eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Well, of course, we know the paradise of God is, is it, you could say it was the Garden of Eden, but that's, that's certainly symbolic because we're not going back in the Garden Eden, but we are going back in a type of the Garden Eden, which is uh, the holy place. We're going back into a sevenfold light, uh, having a full knowledge and a full manifestation of Christ, and that will be in the restored church. He gives them, <clears throat> uh, but going into paradise overcomers goes into paradise the next step is everlasting life mm -hmm. so in ruling and reigning with christ uh, in the bride now of course the next church he writes is is uh smyrna and he ends that in the uh well let's see yes in the 11th verse see that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit said to the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. Of course, we know second death is, an et is eternal death. You know, we're all born dead in the trespasses of sins, or death is hovering over us. We're under the shadow of death. Um, you know, it's, it'll definitely take being born again uh, and overcoming sin to inherit everlasting life and he was just saying a promise to the overcomers that they wouldn't be heard of second death now then the next church he wrote was Pergamus and I'm not going to go through the churches right now because that's not my main thrust for tonight but I am going to I'm just going to show you something uh, in the 17th verse it says he that hath an ear let him hear what the spirit saith unto the churches to him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, save he that receiveth it. So, see, he's giving after every admonition, uh, after every warning, or and after every encouragement that he's writing in these letters to these seven churches, he's he is ending his letters and letting them know that, you still have time to overcome. You still have time to make the bride. He uses different phraseology here, like for an example here, you're gonna eat the hidden manna. You know, that that that's the word of God that is is hidden to the flesh or to the world. You have to be, uh, to get a sevenfold light, that hidden manna from heaven, mm -hmm. having full understanding of God God's plan for you and for his church. And then a white stone uh, where there's a new name and no one except he that receives that stone uh, will know that name. And of course, I know, we know the name is Jesus, but you will not know the, all of the characteristics, not until you get there, not until you arrive of complete righteousness in an overcoming state you're not going to be, you're not going to be a part of the, the you're not going to be a stone in the building of the, of the eternal kingdom. But once, you know, it, you're just going to have to get there. I've said many, many times, you know, 
uh, what is it, the 12th chapter of the book of Revelations where it's talking about those back there in the Jewish church that they overcame by the word of their testimony. And I've, I've mentioned many, many times that you have a testimony. It is your testimony and uh, no one else has it. It's like, a, it's like a fingerprint. It's like an iris of your eye. Nobody has your testimony. You're an individual in particular, in the kingdom of God. And what God is taking you through and doing in your life is your testimony, and you'll have to overcome by the word of your testimony. God's working uh, the truth of his word. His, his, uh, his truth is being worked in your life. True, true knowledge of righteousness, true understanding and wisdom of righteousness. God's working that in each of our lives. And what God's working in you, he may not be working in me right now because, and you have your own individual gift to be a member, to be a, uh, in particular and be an effective member. Uh, you've got to be an individual that God's called and God's given you your testimony and you're becoming his workmanship in your individual part. Um, okay, then, um, let's see, what was the last one I gave you? Um, the new name, the new stone, okay. So then, uh, the next one is in, uh, verse five of chapter three, he that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life and I'll confess his name before my father and before his angels. So here, here you're going to get a, a white raiment. You know, the linen garment, the white linen garment, is a, it's a picture of righteousness. And if you overcome, of course, I, you'll have to actually get a white linen garment to, before you even get in the holy place. But you'll maintain that and it will be a part of, the white robe that you will maintain. And that's not a lint, that's not a literal garment. That is a spiritual uh, type of righteousness. It's God's righteousness in your life that you're, you're putting on righteousness right now, but you'll have it. You'll have righteousness. You're not just going to be putting it on. It will be a part of your character when God gets through working that in you. Okay. Then, um, the church of Philadelphia, verse 12, he that overcometh, him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God. He'll go no more out and I'll write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which coming down out of, cometh down out of heaven from my God and I'll write upon him a new name. So, uh, these promises, he keeps giving us these promises. And then uh, the um, seventh promise is in the 21st verse. It says, to him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I, al I also overcame and sat down on my father in his throne. And so... <clears throat> uh, uh, so then, and we know... Uh, there's a the promise to overcomers in Revelations 21, 7. If you want to go there, uh, since uh, 21, 7. He that, he that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I'll be his God, and he'll be my son. Um, so going back to the seven churches, though, see, if these were church ages, there would be there would be promises to overcomers all down through the dark ages, and I can't I just can't concur with that. That there's a seven number one. Li, li, listen to this. Um, uh, go back to the first chapter, and here's what John was told. Verse 18 said, I'm he that liveth, Jesus talking here, 
and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, amen, and have the keys of hell and of death. And write the things which thou seest, and the things which are the things which shall be hereafter. So he's telling him, look, I'm showing you right now things that are, the things that are at hand, the things that must shortly come to pass, which I believe was AD 70, that John received this writing, these, this instruction to write these letters before AD 70, right in the end of the 60s, in the end of the Jewish world, and God, it was urgent. God wanted them to finish their course before the church completely fell away and there was still time and enough light. Let me show you. The verse 20 says, the mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. Each one of these churches were called candlesticks. Now the candlestick was in the holy place, which we look at as a restored church once it's accomplished. In that holy place is a candelabra or candlestick that has seven lights, seven bowls that oil's put in and it's lit, it's lit and there's seven lights that represents the seven full light, the complete understanding of God's work, his purpose, his word, his righteousness. And in there was a table of showbread, 12 loaves of unleavened bread. It's unleavened because there's no yeast in it. It's not puffed up. Uh, you know, Jesus told his disciples early, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. He was talking about the falsehood in their teachings and in their doctrine. And so, the 12 apostles, the 12 loaves of unleavened bread are in the holy place. That has to be restored and the sevenfold light has to be restored. And uh, so, uh, you know, the, the, the candlestick was did not exist down through the dark ages. If you look at the 11th chapter of the book of Revelation, let me, let's go there right quick the very first verse, um, it, uh, John says, and there was given unto me a reed like unto a rod and the angel stood saying, rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. But the court, which is without the temple, leave it out and measure it not for it's give, given unto the Gentiles and the holy city shall they tread underfoot 40 and two months. So <clears throat> the temple was done away with. There was nothing left. Now this is all, it, it's all an allegorical statement. In other words, in AD 70, the temple was destroyed anyway. But, but, but the church, See, it's, it's no longer a natural temple after the day of Pentecost and Christ's kingdom was set up. It was a spiritual house. Uh, what did Jesus say? He said the, uh, the kingdom of heaven is not with observation, but he said it's in you. It wasn't a, no longer a physical temple. That they were All that physical temple was a picture of everything. But, of course, it, it in what... Uh, was involved there was the outer court, the holy place, and the holy of holies, which is a picture of first to second and third heaven are uh, our walk with God through the beginning of faith and repentance, uh, the four principles of faith and humility and the fear of God and honor that gets us finally to a restored church or the holy place. And so... Uh, that the temple didn't exist once it fell away. So these churches could not have existed, not even as church ages and be a candlestick church. There, there was no sevenfold light down through the dark ages. And so that's why I cannot concur with that thought 
<laughs> if it wasn't for these things that, you know, number one, he was dealing in the letters things that are shortly to come to pass. That was AD 70, no doubt. Things that were at hand, the falling away of the church and the condition of it. He was correcting every one of them churches. He was giving them admonition and encouragement and trying to help them to realize there's still a sevenfold light. Y'all, there's still some of you that can still make the bribe and uh, overcome. And then the fact that there was no sevenfold light down through, there's still not a sevenfold light. Here we are in, in 2012, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, 2020, fixing to look at 2021. And uh, if AD, if, um, if the day of Pentecost was AD 33, you know, we are, what, just a little over 12 years um, from 2,000 years from the, from the early church beginning. And, and uh, so we're, we're down in the end of the 2,000 year world. Well, I, I can't, I just cannot concur that these could be church ages. They were seven letters to those seven churches. And by the way, there was far more churches than seven in, in Asia. But those were the most prominent churches in the most prominent locations um, in Asia of Paul's works. And they very possibly may have been mother churches uh, that were over many of the other churches. They didn't, uh, number one, these seven letters weren't written and just sent one letter to each church. They got the whole book. They got to read everybody's letters and they got to read the entire book. So it's very likely that God wanted them to know, look, seven is a complete number. I'm sending them, you prominent churches in Asia. I'm sending each one of you lining out things that need to be corrected, need to be fixed but many of these things fits all of you. Seven is the whole, the whole picture, the whole of, a whole of the matter. And then they got the whole book of the book of Revelations. They, they were able to see, uh, and I'm certain that they understood far more than we understand today about the book of Revelation because they understood all these symbols. It's, it took us, a long time. God just now revealing uh, more about the Book of Revelations to uh, Book of Revelation to us. So, so let me let me help you to see how the book is laid out. First, God shows what must shortly come to pass and what was at hand, and that was dealing with the the whole body of Christ as a whole, which it finally had went to the Gentiles. Now there were many. There were many Jews, no doubt, in, in those Asian churches because they fled. They had to flee from the persecution and they knew that there was going to be destruction. Um, I know that their prophets showed them that. Jesus prophesied. He, you, know, you remember he, he talked about uh, one of the things he said was, woe be unto them that give suck in those days. In other words, if you've got a little baby, you're going to be fleeing to the mountains and you're going to be, <clears throat> you know, if you've got little children, that's going to slow you down and it's going to be much more difficult for you to flee and try to live in the mountains hiding from uh, from the, the, the destruction of the Roman army. In fact, if you go back and read it, it's, it's horrible. They were surrounded. They couldn't, they were in the mountains. They starved. They starved for water and food. Their babies died. They ate their own children. They drank their own urine and ate their own dung. I'm sorry, but that's just history. It's what happened. And Jesus had told them, you know, uh, uh, you know, to how to beware and to get out of there when the time came. He prophesied of it. And so, um, you know, that is one of the things that I'm telling my people today. I'm telling them we're getting close to the end of the world. You need to consider, uh, you know, the Apostle Paul in the seventh chapter of 1 Corinthians 
uh, one of the things he told to husbands and wives, uh, he told them, he said, the time is short. And those of you that are have wives and have husbands, be as though you, uh, those of you that are married, be as though you're not. Uh, he was just showing that, you know, if you're married, you're going to give your time to your wife. You're going to give your time to your husband. That didn't mean to separate, but what it meant was is down in the very end there, they were trying to dedicate themselves wholly and completely to God, and they did not have time to be trying to raise a family, knowing that the end was coming upon them fairly soon. And so, you know, and I've told my people that. I've, I've told them, be careful, pray, be prayerful, you know, because... People that think this world's just going to go on and on and on is sadly mistaken and don't know the Bible. Uh, so we're living in a in a dire time, uh, and uh, we're we're seeing God move right now. God, I, I doubt that the body of Christ will ever be the same. We have never, in over a hundred years, uh, been ref had to refrain from having meetings. We haven't had a meeting this year and in the body of Christ. And God's making a change. God's making a change among us, and, and, but it's his will. It's what he's gonna work. And, and uh, if we'll watch, be sober, and, uh, and, and keep, keep uh, stay sensitive to the Lord, the Lord's gonna show us and help us get through all of this. Um, so, uh, so that was first, the churches, the letters to the churches in Asia to address what was shortly to come to pass and what was at hand. Then remember, he told John, said, write that that must be hereafter. So after he writes the, the letters in the third chapter, then in the fourth chapter, notice in the fourth chapter, and most of the people that's here in the uh, Little Rock Church knows this because I've taught it many times, but uh, those of you that are not, local members, uh, you know, I'm, I'm covering some of this for you. And chapter four in the first verse in the book of Revelation says, after this, I looked and behold, a door was opened in heaven and the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, come up hither and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. So, uh, after the things that were at hand and must shortly come to pass was taken care of in writing the seven letters to the seven churches, then John was shown the future. Come up hither and I will show you. Now he didn't go anywhere physically, but in the spirit, God caught him up in the spirit to hear and see the vision of the future of the Gentile world. And so uh, God, God uh, began to show him the future starting in the fourth, fourth chapter. And I, I'm not gonna try to teach on all that. I will tell you the fourth chapter is a picture of a restored church in the end of the Gentile world. John saw the church fall away. He saw it in the condition that it was in. He, he, he saw the demise of the body of Christ and that it was coming to its close. He knew though that there would be a restored church in the end of the Gentile world. They preached that. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the apostle Paul, he, he taught that, that the Lord, there'd be a great falling away, which he's talking about the falling away of the church. Um, that I heard a minister that was raised and in this body for many years, I heard him talking just recently saying that the falling away was down here. I couldn't hardly believe anyone would make that statement that knew this message because that scripture in Second Thessalonians 2 is not at all talking about down here. It's talking about the falling away of the church back there and the darkness that came upon the Gentile world. But he said that, that would be destroyed by the brightness of the coming of the Lord. You can read it in the second chapter of Second Thessalonians. And so uh, here 
in the fourth chapter, John saw that there was going to be a restored church. I'm sure that I'm sure that part of the vision was exciting to him. I'm sure he was lifted up by it because he saw in the fourth and in part of the fifth chapter, he saw that. And then, of course, in the fifth chapter, he saw the book that had seven seals on it. No man, uh, no man in in heaven, uh, in heaven. Uh, in the earth, on the earth, or under the earth, was able to open it. But uh, the angel stopped when he began to weep and said, Behold, the Lamb of the tribe of Judah has prevailed to open the book and loose its seals. And of course, and the, then, then I'll tell you this about the seals the sixth chapter and the seventh chapter. The sixth chapter is the six seals. Is, is loosed, and you're very familiar with the four horses, the white, red, black, and pale horse. And then uh, those under the altar, those that were in persecution down through the dark ages. And then there was an earthquake. Uh, and that's that, now see that goes into this, that, that even goes into the seventh trumpet. I mean, it relates. The, the trumpets don't blow to the eighth chapter, but it does relate. It's just, a, it's prophesying covering part of the same time frame of the church being restored. And in the seventh chapter, the bride's made up the new earth and then the end comes of everlasting life. And that's just a synopsis. But in, then the seventh seal opens in the eighth chapter. And the seventh seal opens and reveals everything. The first six seals are indexes. The seventh seal is what has been indexed and it opens the whole book. So that'll help you understand somewhat of how it was written. I won't go into all, all of that tonight, but I wanna go, uh, I wanna cover something in the 17th chapter. I think I've got time here. Um, because I find even in, in uh, the people here locally that it's, it's hard to put all this together. And I know that it is, unless God has really, you know, helped you and, or, and someone has really taught you that really knows it. And I'll just be honest with you. Uh, I'd say God's been dealing with me about 30 years or longer maybe closer to 40. Concerning the book of Revelation, it's just, I think it is part of my calling. I, it's not something that I, you know, it's just, not, it's not something that I long to do, but it's just something that it works in my gift. And the Lord, you know, I can remember years and years ago when God used to wake me up in the middle of the night and my mind would be going with scriptures in the book of Revelation and I'd get up and go, that time I didn't have an office or anything. We were we, we didn't, couldn't afford an office, so uh, I'd go to the kitchen table. And I, sometimes I was at the kitchen table for for more than a day, more than twenty four hours, just eating the this word, you know, and trying to understand it. Sometimes I'd go months or even years. There's certain parts of it I couldn't understand, but finally God would open up a part to me. And then it's just like me telling you about those church ages. See, if you didn't know it, it, the church age message sounds good. I mean, it it sounds good. Trying to unfold and understand that here, the first three chapters of the book is just dealing with seven of the churches back there. The fact that AD 70 was coming on them, the church was going to completely fall away but there was still time to make the bride and then switch over to the fourth chapter that, okay, now, now you're going to see the future. That was hard to come to an understanding for me. It was anyway. And so, uh, you know, if you wanted to look at it as church ages and just carry it right on, well, you know, it sounds good, but then if, unless you really understand those scriptures to know how could that be, the time at hand? How could that be uh, things that need to shortly come to pass? Down through all the way for 2,000 years, shortly come to pass? The Lord, 
You know, I know eternity is a long time for the Lord, but 2,000 years is not a short time to him. Uh, anyway, so uh, it's not a short time to us either. And this is talking to people that understand what's long and what's short. Um, anyway, uh, so, uh, but down here in the 17th chapter of the book of Revelation, it's dealing with Babylon. And it's dealing with the the heads of the beast, the the, and and that's where people do get somewhat confused. So I thought maybe I would try to explain that to a certain extent. And I've got time, I think, so I'm going to just read. I'm going to try to start off the first verse and try to read and do a little explaining to you. I hope this is not boring to you, but um, but it is important, saints. You do need to understand this. It wouldn't have been written. It's for God's servants, not just, it's not just for the ministry. The ministry, of course, has to be able to explain it, but it's, it's important for you to understand what's going, where we're at in God's table, what has happened, timetable, what has happened, what's happening right now, and what's going to happen. So here in the 17th uh, chapter of the book of Revelations, the angel goes back and begins to fill in more detail to John to help him understand a little bit better. The first verse, chapter 17, says, And there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me, saying unto me, Come, come hither, and I'll show unto thee the judgment of the great whore which sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. You, you'll read almost the same wording in the 18th chapter when God gets ready to judge Babylon, the next chapter. But let's go on, verse three. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman set upon a scarlet colored beast full of names of blaspheming, having seven heads and 10 horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great. Get this, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. It's not just one church. It's not just one group of people. It is the mother of harlots. She's a harlot and she has produced harlots into the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admonition. And the angel said unto me, wherefore didst thou marvel? I'll tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast which carrieth her, which has seven heads and ten horns. The beast that thou sawest was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and goeth into perdition, and they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. Now, let's talk about that here just a minute. Okay, the, the, the Catholicism, you know, was established way back in 538. Actually, 325 is when the, when the papacy was put into power, but it took him to 538 before he actually gained control of the world and that the whole world wondered after him. Um, and uh, he, he was and is not because he was in power, but then he lost power in 1798, 1260 years later from 538 AD. He went out of power when, uh, uh, when the uh, oh, <laughs> Napoleon, when, when Napoleon put him in prison and stopped his rule over the earth. And so he was in power, but now he is not. But yet he is. He's not. He's not 
been done away with, and and he is going to be in, in full power again. Let's read on. Uh, and here's the mind of the half wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. And there are seven kings, five are fallen, one is, and the, and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. Okay, let's look at that. There, there are seven kings. There are seven he heads of the dragon that came up out of the sea in the 13th chapter. And that's what he's dealing with here. Five are fallen. Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Medo-Persia, and Greece. And one is Rome. Rome was in power when this was written. Uh, and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. I say that's the United States of America. I say that that is the two-horned beast that spake as a lamb, um, that two horns of a lamb, uh, a beast that rose up out of the earth. Let's stop right here and go back to that just real quick. I want, because some of you may not have been able to follow me through all this. So look at the 13th chapter. Hold your place because we're just going to tap on something and we'll come right back. So in the 13th chapter and the 11th verse, uh, first, let me let me read the very first verse in the 13th chapter because this deals with the papacy coming into power. He says, I stood upon the sand of the sea and, the, and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and 10 horns, and upon his horns, 10 crowns, and upon the heads, the name of blasphemy. Okay, there, that, it, these are the same world powers. That's what these heads of the beast is, is Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, and Rome. And, okay, now, but look in the 11th verse. Now you see something different. After he explains that, that the, the papacy ruled the whole world, followed after him for 1260 years. Then verse 11, he said, and I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, Notice that these these this other beast came up out of the sea. All of them came up out of the sea. The sea is a picture of the world. The world, how, they came up out of the world and evolved from one another. That's why in the second verse it says the beach which I saw was likened to a leopard. This is going back to Daniel seven. It was likened to a leopard, which was uh, Greece had the feet of a bear, which was identified in Daniel 7 as Medo-Persia, and had the mouth of a lion, which was Babylon. And the dragon gave him power. That was the terrible beast that Daniel couldn't even identify what it was. He just called it a terrible beast. Okay, but they came up out of the sea. Here in the 11th verse, another beast coming up out of the earth he had two horns like a lamb and spake as a dragon. I say that's the United States of America. I say that the two horns like a lamb, they, this nation was lamb-like in the beginning, both civil and religious. Our forefathers that, that uh, developed our constitution and the laws of this nation were God-fearing men they prayed, they believed in Jesus. They put on our, our dollar, the uh, one nation under God. They had the prayers in the courtrooms in the Supreme Court. Uh, these were God-fearing men and they, dis they uh, developed a constitution that had separation of church and state. These two horns, horns and prophecy is, is, is power. One horn is, is civil power. The other one's religious power. And both of them were lamb-like in the beginning. They had the fear of God. They were Christ, believers in Christ, the lamb, in the beginning when this world was set up. But, and it said, and he spake as a dragon. And if you read it on, 
That, by the way, come up out of the earth, and the earth there is talking about religion. It's talking about the restoration of the church that finally settled in America, the United States of America. We did not come up, neither were we evolved out of the world of these other world powers, but this nation developed out of religion. It developed out of a restored church and God brought it to America to restore his church and to make up his bride. And of course, he, America carries this message out into other parts of the world and no doubt some of them will make the bride, but he's also getting ready for the new earth. So the reason I brought you that, go back to Revelation 17 now. The reason I brought that to you is because if we go back to the 10th verse, and there's seven kings, five are fallen, Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Medo-Persia, and Greece. One is Rome, okay? And the other is not yet come, and when he cometh, he must continue a short space. I say that's the United States of America. The United States of America will make up the seventh head, and but it'll only be short-lived. The United States will be the shortest-lived dragon power. It spake as a dragon. I showed you that in the 13th chapter. And it's going to make, it's going to make the image to the beast and the pap and it'll give its power to the papacy right here. It said, and the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth, is of the seventh and goeth into perdition. That's the papacy will come back in power and become the eighth head and will rule after America falls. And America will fall. America has been blessed more greater than any other nation uh, in our times, in the last, uh, what, 21776, uh, so 250 years, whatever it is, 230 something years, so America is the greatest, it's the most blessed nation in this world right now because uh, God is, is showing uh, in, in this nation, he's showing exactly what's gonna happen in the end of this world and America will be judged. God would, this nation's turned on God. You'd almost think, Sodom and Gomorrah would have to be repented to if he doesn't, if God doesn't judge this, this nation for which where it's heading and what it's going through. And so uh, the, the seven kings, uh, five fallen, uh, one's not yet come, it's coming, the dragon power of the United States and the beast that was and is not, even he's the seventh that goeth in perdition. Now the next verse, and the 10 horns which thou sawest are 10 kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but receiveth power as kings one hour with the beast. They have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. You may have a little bit of uh, difficulty, uh, you know, understanding these 10 kings that the United States will have to go out of existence as far as a dragon power, are a world power, they'll have to go out of existence if 10 kings are gonna come in power and be a greater power than the United States. So you just have to admit something's gonna to have to happen in the United States. Well, when I say it falls, I'm not saying that it's gonna be devastated to the point that it's not gonna be existent. I just think it's, its main military power, its financial power and civil power will be devastated to a point that no longer will the United States have the dominance over the world that it has today. And it will even get greater than it is right now before it's over with. Uh, but uh, then 10 Kings. Now I don't, we don't know exactly what the 10 Kings are. I put the 10 Kings as the United Nations right now. The number 10 in, the, in prophecy means judgment and the judgment of this world right now, uh, the United States is looked at as holding a judgment seat to hold this world intact. It, when America falls, and that's gonna be the, the earthquake in the sixth chapter of the book of Revelations, 
And in the uh, 14th chapter of the book of Revelations, that will be the earthquake that'll shake this world. It's also a picture of Elijah going up on Mount Horeb and uh, finally a great shaking there that Elijah is told to go put Elisha in his in his his office. And that's where the Jews will be grafted back in when this when America falls and the church is on uh, the rise of, of restoration. The church will be restored during this time and the Jews will be grafted back in. I could say a lot more on that right now. I don't have time though. But these 10 kings, the reason I make it the United Nations right now, as far as as much as I can see, is because the United Nations will try to, it's the only power I know of in the world that can try to bring some uh, stabilization to the world when America falls. Uh, I feel certain that's going to happen. I don't, I don't see anything. I don't see any other way it can happen. Anyway, uh, these 10 kings then will come into power. And let's read just a little bit more and we'll finish up here. And the 10 kings, verse 12, verse, uh, yeah, 12. The 10 horns which thou sawest, 10 kings which have received no kingdom as yet, but received power as kings one hour with a the beast. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. These shall make war with the lamb and the lamb shall overcome them. And he is Lord of Lord and King of Kings. And they that are with him are called the chosen, the chosen and faithful, the called, called chosen and faithful. Uh, just like the early church, just like Rome came against the, the dragon power of that day, came against uh, the church and there was great persecution. There'll be great persecution at that time. That's what it's talking about when it's talking about the 10 kings will make war with the lamb, but the lamb will overcome them in the same way that the early church overcame the, the, uh, the, uh, the war that they had is a spiritual war uh, with, with Rome back there. Here it will be with the 10 kings and it will be the beast the papacy will come back into power and there will be great persecution because the mark of the beast is going to be set up and most of the Christian world, most of the world will join up with the beast and take the mark. And verse 15 said, and saith unto me, the waters which thou sawest where the whore sitteth are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. And the 10 kings which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore and shall make her desolate and naked and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. For God, God put it in her will to fulfill his will and to agree and give their kingdom to the beast until the words of God be fulfilled. Think about that. Let me read the next verse. And the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the king's of the earth. It's Babylon. Of course, he goes in the judgment of Babylon. Before it's judged, we're going to have to get God's people, all that can be got out of Babylon, we're going to have to get them out of there. Bring them into the body of Christ. They'll have an opportunity to finish their work in the end of this world. Um, I think you'll see it. it'll be like, like John the Baptist. You know, but when John the Baptist uh, was beheaded, his, his John the Baptist is uh, disciples went to Jesus. And you'll see uh, the, the Baptist movement uh, in this world will never join up with the mark of the beast. They, they, have, they, they won't give in to that, and went, but they will lose their headship. They'll lose their organization. The government will, will put them out. And when that happens, that's a type of John the Baptist's head being cut off. And when that happens, those people will flock into the body of Christ. The, the disciples of John the Baptist will come to Jesus, the, his body. And so we got a lot of work to do, saints. There's a lot of God's people. We're gonna have to be able to help these people when they get here. And it's a time to watch and be sober and to know. And one strange thing's here, God puts it in the mind of these 10 kings to give their power to the beast for one hour. That's the last prophetical hour. But then 
they wind up hating the whore and burning her flesh. And of course, <coughs> that war is going to end in Armageddon, which is going to finish the work of God. That judgment of God that's going to come on this world. Uh, that's probably going to be more Arab nations right now. They're more in, in number as far as the majority is concerned in the UN. And uh, God will probably use them. They deceitfully will put in with the beast at that time, but uh, they will uh, they will hate it. And they finally destroy it. And, and finally it'll bring about the battle of Armageddon, which will finally end this work, the end of this world. Wish I had time more time maybe to deal more with it, but I hope maybe I was able to clarify some things for you. Um, I put on my uh, uh, intro before the before I started the broadcast tonight, my phone number, if you want to text questions to me, feel free to. I'll, I, I can't promise you I'll get right back to you tonight, but I will this week. I'll get back to you and try to answer your questions. Um, I'm not trying, saints of God, I'm not trying to be uh, dominant on this subject. I'm just trying to share with you my position. And uh, there is some differences in the body, but for the most part, I'm teaching you the, the, the body teaching. There's a few di little differences there. Adjustments can be made, but I have to stick with the way I'm seeing this. And there's new light opening up on it all the time. And so uh, I just wanted to share it with you tonight. God help you. God bless you. Uh, please keep praying for Brother Bud, Brother Dahl, uh, Brother Dwayne Jolly, Brother uh, Jose Luis. Pray for him. Pray for all of them. They, they need your prayers. Brother Bud needs a miracle. I'm still believing God's going to pull him through this. Also, if I could mention to you, Brother Roy Durham and Sister Laura Durham drove hard for two days to get to Los Angeles, California. Brother Durham's father's 90 years old. He, um, he wasn't a diabetic, but his blood sugar jumped up to 1,000. They got him in the hospital. His kidneys is shutting down. Uh, he's on life support on the ventilator. It doesn't look good doesn't look like, you know, it's going to take God to help him. He's got a very minute chance of pulling out of it at his age and the condition of, that he's in right now. So pray for that family. Pray for uh, Brother Durham Sr., Brother Roy Durham's dad. He is a precious man of man, and he loves God and is a great Christian. Uh, so pray for him and pray for Brother and Sister Durham that they make it back safely. They've got a lot that's going to happen in the next few days uh, if their father passes away I'm sure he's looking at a funeral over there um, if, if he if he was to pull out of it well then they then they're gonna have to figure out what they're gonna do he's he's lived all these years by himself and's taken care of himself he's been in very good health and has a very sharp mind bless his heart he's just a precious man I love him we've he's visited us many many times in our church anyway pray for them if you would uh, pray for the the missionary works. Pray for Brother Fidel over in uh, Guatemala. Pray for the works in the Dominican Republic and in, in, uh, Cuba, uh, Honduras, Mexico. Brother Brother Bud's works in Mexico and uh, Brother Wright. Uh, uh, let's see. Yeah, out in California is who I was thinking of. He's got works. Uh, and uh, in Ecuador, and he also some in Mexico. And then uh, I'm talking about Brother John Wright. And uh, then, of course, Brother and Sister Peach in the Philippines, that, that work over there, Brother... Uh, uh, oh, help me here. Over in Honduras, Brother... just don't work as good as it used to. I'll think of it here in a minute. Uh, I don't know why I want to say Brother Fitzsimmons. I know it starts with an F, but I can't get it to come to my mind. 
Uh, but anyway, pray for the work in Honduras. Uh, pray for the Little Rock Church. Also pray for Brother Dennis White, Brother Tubby, those two leading men there in Nacogdoches. That Nacogdoches church is, is suffering right now with their pastor laying in, in uh, uh, ICU with a ventilator on life support in very dire need of God's touch. And that church loves that pastor. And they, they're asking us to help them pray if in any way God would consider to touch him and lift him up out of this. He's my precious fam. Brother Fenicum, thank you, Brother Painter. I couldn't, I couldn't get that to come to my mind. Brother Fenicum in Honduras, pray for those works over there. Also, uh, uh, the works in Africa, uh, Brother Goodwin's works over, over in Africa. Uh, there, we've just got works everywhere right now and nations uh, overseas. So we, you know, we need to pray for those people because many of them are hurting uh, for, for finances. Many of them don't have jobs with this coronavirus is hitting them pretty hard. All right, God bless your hearts. Those of you from the local church here in Little Rock, I'll see you Sunday morning, Bible study Continental breakfast at 9.30 in the dining room, Bible study at 10, and church upstairs, worship service at 11.30. God bless your hearts. I love all of you. Pray for me, and I'll pray for you. You stay safe and be careful, and may the Lord God bless you richly. Amen.